come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a movie review podcast or a movie book club, right? Podcast, or we sit around and we talk about a movie that's been chosen round robin by one of the internet radio superstars. You can help us out in our quest for total world domination. All you got to do to make us be- become one of the fastest growing podcasts in the galaxy is go on over to wherever you found us and hit that like subscribe or star rating. Give us a review wherever you found us. All that stuff helps us rise up through the ether of the algorithms in our quest for total world domination these are the internet radio superstars holly john michaela and i'm colin and tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by colin we watched a movie tonight we did believe it or not i know this is still in the didn't feel like it no oh, yeah what'd you feel like feel like you were playing a video game uh it felt like an invasion of my senses <laughs> Well, tonight we watched a movie from the year 2002, 2004, sorry, this one comes from 2004, yes. and it's called President Evil Apocalypse. Apocalypse. And, uh, Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. The best way to intro this movie. <laughs> so, good God, there's like, uh, we should probably tell people, okay, so for those of you who, uh, once upon a time back in the day, they used to do this thing called putting numbers next to movie titles. So it'd be like, you know, Friday the 13th, part two, part three, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Now we don't do any of that. That's old yeah, and kosher. Yeah, we can bring that back. That'd be very helpful, I think. Well, no, isn't it more fun when the audience has to do all that work themselves and try and figure out, is it apocalypse, extinction, retribution, afterlife, no. uh, you know? Yeah, because you can't just be like, uh, Resident Evil movie you're talking about. I had to double check so many times to make sure I was renting the right one because I was yeah. not going to pay for more than one of these movies. I was so yeah. fucking anxious about starting the wrong one. And then when all the cover art was exactly the same, I was like, oh my God, how am I supposed to find the right movie? I seriously pulled up our inst- our Instagram like four times. Yeah. To get. <laughs> like, which one yeah, are we watching? It's going to title, right? It would be great, Holly, <laughs> since you've never seen any of these, if you'd watched an entirely different movie. Yeah. And I was I was thinking then, about that when it started. No. I was like, one one of you who would be going like, wait a second, what are you talking about? This is a completely different movie than what you're watching. <laughs> but that didn't happen. Do you guys have any experience with uh, any prior experience with uh, Resident Evil, the phenomenon? No, none whatsoever. I all I knew was that the only thing I knew was the the star. That was it. I didn't know what it was about. I've been confused as hell. Yeah, actually. Um, I have oh. played most of the games. I played Resident Evil 4 on GameCube, which has a completely different protagonist. Jesus. Like a completely that's a, different that's an protagonist. Odd one. It's like, it's, it, it was a fun game. I remember being, it being creepy and having a good time playing it. But yeah, it is not. The story is completely different than anything in any of these movies. Oh, yeah. So what I know oh, is yeah. completely yeah. useless. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, I guess. Uh, okay, so we're saying three of us have some familiarity with the Resident Evil video games. I mean, right now, like I said last week, the reason I chose this is because I'm going through a Resident Evil moment. Resident Evil <laughs> 3, the <laughs> remake. for a while, Colin. This is so a what passing thing. Yeah, I know. This, so is, this is my favorite so video game franchise. Here. What we're looking at here is me, no knowledge. Michaela, useless knowledge. Colin, all knowledge. And Sean, where are you at? Uh, I've played most of the game. So I know all the game storylines. And I okay. stopped watching after this movie, as far as the series goes. Because okay. the movie series is very different than the video game series. Um, the video game was created in the year uh, 1998, was it? The first one? I think so. 1996, right? 96 is what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. So it was... Um, Okay, so there's several firsts in this, because this is a phenomena that we're talking about, Resident Evil. It is currently, I think, Capcom, the publisher Capcom, it's their highest grossing video game of all time, uh, you know, through the series and the comic books and the movies. And you think there's six of these live action things, but there's three more CG animated movies, one of which I actually paid to see in a theater. 
Uh, <laughs> so I mean, so degeneration. Her, yeah, degenerate. What was her degeneration? And oh god, there was there was two other ones, but they actually do have the the game characters in them. So Leon yes. S. Kennedy and Chris Redfield and Albert Joe Wesker Valentine. and yeah, they show up in the in the actual movie version. So um, where Resident Evil came from? Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory here, but uh, there was. The they keep on citing a video game that came out in 1989 that was uh, tied into a Japanese movie that came out the same year, and it was called Sweet Home. And I don't know if any of you this is the I think for the Famicom system, right? Anybody? Damn. Famicom. So yeah, it was one like of those Japanese Nintendo. Yes, and it was an overhead dealio where you just had a map and you wandered around like a, I don't know if it was a 16 bit game or something like that, but it was about investigators. The movie that it was based on was these investigators go to a house, a mansion and ghoulish shit happens. And this was created by a guy named Tokuru Fujiwara. And, um, but the real person who's, uh, who's credited as being the genius behind the resident evil franchise is a guy named Shinji Mikami. Right. He also did um, Resident Evil. He did Dino Crisis. Right, Sean? Dino yeah. Crisis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Dino Crisis. Uh, he did the Resident Evil remake that came out in 2002 <laughs> for the uh, the GameCube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He did Dino, Dino Crisis. Crisis. Oh, this is what these are classics. Uh, and he, if you, you seriously might as well be speaking German right now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a, there's a tie into that too that we'll get to. The Germans have a whole lot to do with the Resident Evil. It turns out, uh, at least the movie versions. But um, so basically, the the this Resident Evil was the first game that coined the term. Capcom came up with the term in the marketing and called it survival horror. Right? Yes. Which I think that term has been used hundreds and thousands. I mean, that's just like a part of the cultural lexicon at this point, right? Survival horror. It's the idea that, you know, somehow you're going to be starring in a horror movie yourself through a video game and uh, you have to survive a horror movie, basically, right? Yes. It's not a bad idea. The guy, apparently, uh, Mikami was uh, obsessed with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and uh, Evil Dead. And uh, he said that... um, Somehow his uh, creation of the original Resident Evil was a response in part to Lucio Fulci's zombie. Right? Where he I said that one. He said that that movie, he had a disappointment with it. They did all these things wrong with zombies and he wanted to fix it. Right? Wow, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it is. I can't actually find that quote, probably because I don't don't read Japanese, but I see a bunch of people referring to that he has said this, so maybe this is anecdotal. But uh, I, this guy in video games did several things that are landmark in that industry. Number one, he created the survival horror game with Resident Evil. He did the Resident Evil remake for the GameCube in 2002, and then he also did Resident Evil 4 in uh what year was that that was 2005 and the thing that resident evil 4 did that revolutionized video games was it was the first game to have a third person perspective with a camera over the person's shoulder and from that every video game after that is pretty much like <laughs> adopted that camera angle you yeah know? Yep. um Absolutely. so um the game is the at least the first couple of games it's like so it's going to be like this zombie kind of game where basically cops go into or the stars right what stars stand stars for? stars members what's it stand for stars uh uh special tactics oh, what's the s and special tactical and rescue squad there you go an elite stars. they're an elite oper- operation of the raccoon city police department they go to this mansion in the spooky Why woods is it raccoon city why not? Is it Cause, okay? Because raccoons was... carry disease. I, 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 raccoons carry disease. I have no idea. <laughs> well, it's yeah. I, I don't know where they came up with that. I mean, is it because uh, again, you're looking at this is it, it's a Japanese uh, company making a game a storyline that takes place in America. So I don't know if raccoon. Yeah. Oh, in the original Maybe game, it's course, a lost in translation thing. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, Resident Evil is the Americanized title. The actual uh, Japanese game is called anybody biohazard. There you go. Boom. Um, 
So Resident Evil, like we forget what that used to mean prior to the, the when this game came up, but you know. Did it mean something before this? <laughs> well, it was like if you had something in the family, you know, like there was a cousin who did something, there was a Resident Evil, you know, it was a, like a, a yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the video game becomes this huge hit and they make, uh, I think at the point where the move, the first movie comes out, they'd made three of the video games, maybe four, right? As we're up to code Veronica at this point, there's resident evil, resident evil two, resident evil three nemesis. And then I think code Veronica came out before resident evil three. Okay. Those are like the four because. I don't think they've gone past that because this movie draws heavily from Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay, question. Shoot. How, yes. far, how far into the release of the video games did they start making the movies? Well, that's what I think. I mean, I don't have the, the actual dates for Code Veronica or Nemesis in front of me, but clearly Nemesis was out at the time that this movie was made in 2004. I think they were maybe four into the, at least three or four into the series when they started making the movies. Yeah. Have they, have they come out with any like graphic novels or like oh, yeah. comic series? Oh, yeah. have, okay. Full on novels. Yeah, a, I mean, it's a huge industry. Thing, yeah. yeah. And mini games. There's like, cause as of today, there are seven numbered games in the series. Right. And an eighth one that's been announced, but there's also all these spinoffs for like, you know, the different uh, portable uh, systems and all yeah, that. So I mean, like it keeps on going. There's uh, there's different perspectives, like different games. Is like you're on a rail shooter. Um, there's uh, a big touch, kind of every uh, uh, gameplay mechanic for different uh, different games and on different platforms. Yeah. So do do you think do you think this series has sprung the most like other media outlets more than any other like game series. I don't know. I mean, when you look at I mean, Pokemon is like as huge. You say, Pokemon and, is definitely up there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah and Pokemon true. is probably the top one, but this one's pretty yeah. far reaching. I would say. Yeah. It's like a multimedia, you know, empire of stuff. And it's amazing just yeah. how much you can keep spinning out of it when it's like, there's really, you know, I mean, they, the, one of the big complaints about the movies is they don't use any of the characters from the video game or they didn't, you know, in the first one. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But None. it's like, you know, I, there's that, nothing really, t- <laughs> but there's nothing really to those characters. Right. I mean, I mean, I think it's, I was going to say this movie is my only basis of that very thing, but I feel like maybe I get why. <laughs> based on this well it's different when you play as the character right you play as jill valentine through you know several of the the games and when you're playing as a character who's a cypher basically the only thing that you're really taking away from it is like how she's been designed what she's looked what what she looks like what the color costume she's wearing that kind of stuff i think you feel protective what's what's her name jill valentine this is is our main no, she's Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield, Leon Kennedy. Those are like interchangeably the, the main protagonists of the video game series. Um, okay. Yeah. When I, the only game I ever played, you played as Leon Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he made his debut. So that's why I'm like, my information's useless. <laughs> well, he showed up for the first time in Resident Evil 2, the video game. Um, which is the one that took you out of the mansion. All the, all the video games go basically the same way, right? Uh, investigators have to, you know, check into some kind of bioweapon outbreak or something. You're in like a confined environment that usually starts off kind of looking like it uses a lot of gothic horror imagery, right, mm-hmm. in some way. And then eventually you find somewhere buried beneath the surface is the big, nice, clean sterile umbrella corporation uh facility with all you know the lab <laughs> yeah <laughs> which You're leads to ever finding lab underneath <laughs> buildings. like the deeper I, down you go you find different labs and then different zombies i'm pretty <laughs> sure in the one i played you had to like rescue the president's daughter yeah sherry yeah, Burke. that one that one changed it a bit because you played part four that one changed it from zombies to a like an infection of uh, a parasite Infection yeah. in the in the in the mountains of some village in Europe, which yeah. was uh, at that point a departure from yeah. what had been established as the Resident Evil. But isn't Evil. 
But isn't that what we kind of watched tonight? Saving the president's daughter? Kind of. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's all some, it's all some version of that. <laughs> Basically. Which is why I'm like, this movie does kind of, uh, more so even than the first one, I think, like, kind of, especially now that the remakes have come out, because that's kind of, you know, like, the the when the original Resident Evil games came out, they were from the PlayStation or PlayStation 2, right? Yeah. Um, And then the, then the GameCube remake, and now they're remaking uh, the, the older ones, 2 and 3 of the remakes have just come out, and they look like m- super modern video games. But they use th- this movie's aesthetic for like what uh, the Raccoon City looks like, you know, what yeah. it's like to be on the streets with the, you know, the lighting and all that. It's like they kind of look um, similar that way. So it's like a cycle where like the movie success is kind of fed the video games, <laughs> which uh, fed the, uh, and the we, movies. Yeah. And we mean that in a good way, though, despite what you feel about this movie. Uh, it, it's a good way that they've influenced the video games because, like Colin was saying, the remakes that just came out of the video games two and three are uh, pretty spectacular. Well, I think the the yeah they are, and they go back to the survival horror origins of the um, of the series because for a while there, I think you know by the time you got to to six, uh, it was like the Michael Bay Resident Evil. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. think this movie was big? I mean, the scope in that is huge, and it's like now we're playing action games and. I remember when this thing was billed as survival horror and, you know, everybody kind of wanted to get back to that. Stumbling around in the dark with a flashlight and barely enough ammo to kill the zombies in front of you. Yeah. The terror. Well, speaking of zombies. Okay. So this is, this is another thing where resident evil kind of fuels at the time, you know, because that's why when I I was, I was just sitting there watching this movie tonight and there are zombies, you know, in the streets and all this other stuff. This is the year 2004 that we're seeing this. And this movie came out in September. And prior to that, in March, the Dawn of the Dead remake had come out. And prior to that, uh, in 2002, um, 28 days later, and the original Resident Evil movie had come out. And so this was kind of, I think, the Resident Evil video games... um, created a resurgence in the interest of zombie movies at the time that in 2002, there hadn't been like a major Hollywood or like a zombie movie since, I mean, like what, like return of the living dead or day of the dead, like 1985, you know I mean? It had been a while since we had zombies. And yeah. after this period in time, it's like zombies took over popular culture and they're every, <laughs> you know? So you watch this yeah. going like, yeah, I've and seen this really before, but away. But at oh, the time that this here. came out, it hadn't been seen in a while. Did you know George uh, Romero, the creator of the modern zombie, um, was hired to do? Well, first of all, he did a commercial in Japan for the release of Resident Evil 2, the video game. And so when they came around to the idea that they were going to make a Resident Evil movie, they went to George Romero. So he actually had his assistant tape hours of them playing the video game and tried to come up with a screenplay and i've read it it's it would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars but it was more accurate to the video game uh in ways it makes departures in other ways uh and they fired him because uh, it wasn't that good and wasn't really what they were going after (laughs) (laughs) so george romero fired you don't know zombies you're fired yeah um the other Maybe big that Anderson kid. That's right. Which brings us to the other, uh, you know, aside from uh, Shinji Mikami, the other guy we got to talk about when you talk about the Resident Evil movies is Paul William Scott Anderson, also known as Paul W S Anderson, not to be confused with Paul Thomas Anderson or P T Anderson, the one kind director who brought us stuff like Mortal Kombat, which we covered on this show. And uh, Event Horizon, which we also covered on the show. Uh oh! But he did not direct tonight's movie. He no, was he just didn't. no. That's very true. But he wrote them all. He wrote the entire the Resident Evil series is his baby. He wrote all six movies. He directed the first one, sat the second and third ones out, and then he came back to do uh, four, five, and six. Isn't he married to Yovovich? Yes, he is. Because he uh-huh. met her uh-huh. on Resident Evil. <laughs> yeah, they it's, met on um, Resident Evil? Uh, on the first one, yeah. But they were married in uh, 2009. 
Um, so they started working on these in two in two thousand. Um, okay. But yeah, Anderson also. I mean, he did what? Soldier, Aliens versus Predator, Death Race, Three Musketeers, Pompeii. But like the thing that's going to be written on his tombstone, Paul W S Resident Evil Anderson. Yep. You know, it's funny you say that, Colin, because I for a second there I second guessed what you were saying because. I thought you were confusing it with the franchise I confuse this with all the time, Underworld. Because Kate Beckinsale <laughs> was married to Len Weissman. Yes. Right. There's amazing Collins. parallels between those Collins two. other favorite series. <laughs> like, I, I, this might be an unpopular opinion, but as someone who doesn't know much about either of them, and like the most I know is what I gleaned from the trailers, they seem pretty interchangeable. I was at some point hoping that Celine from Underworld and Alice from Resident Evil would uh, team up or have to fight or something because they were both owned by, um, or oh, I think Constantine Film, that's the German company that basically funded all these movies. So yeah, they are foreign films, even though they look like American movies, the, the money is coming from Germany, which explains why Raccoon City has like a stars unit made up of Russians Yuri and what was the other guy's name? And they and Mikhail, Mikhail, and the guy from uh, uh, um, Christmas Story, okay. Scott oh, yeah, Farkas, Zach Ward. has like some crazy Russian accent because I think they're like this is international, right? I mean, Resident Evil goes across the world, so we're going to try and represent like all the different territories that are big fans of well, the they video. Did game. Pull that from Resident Evil Three. I will say that the game they have Russian. Yeah, Joe runs into some Russians and has to help them as the game goes by. Yeah, there is, right? A guy from, yeah, yeah. that's right. Colonel so and so is, yeah. Yeah, Carlos Oliveira from Resident Evil 3 is in this movie, played by Oded Fair, who we will all remember yeah. as the guy from The Mummy. Not The Mummy. But The Mummy. And The Mummy Return. Yeah. Um, so. Where was I going? Paul, oh, Underworld. Question, Underworld. Polly. No, wait, but <laughs> Underworld. Okay, so yeah, you've got uh, movies that lasted how many? I think Underworld, there's five, there's six Resident Evils. Um, they started around the same time. It was like 2002, 2003, something like that. Uh, both uh, kick ass supernatural heroines uh, leading the franchise. Yeah, I actually, I could actually see this this crossover happening. This one makes sense to me. I, I would actually like to see that. Where I'm kind of surprised they had it. Yeah, I'm a little surprised I haven't done that. Zombie werewolves? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, that's got Let's big bucks written all over it. You know somebody Came somewhere was thinking about and it. Mila Jovovich kicking ass together? Like, uh, yeah, I'm down with that. Oh, yeah, that. That came up in a meeting sometime. Yeah, and I'm surprised if you couldn't get away from it or get away with it in the movie, you could at least make the comic book. Right. Yeah. Sure. For you sure. Know, this is a no brainer. Davis film or whoever owns Davis film also Seems produced like the, the silent Hill movie too. So like they were, they were going all in. For <laughs> Ooh, silent Hill. <laughs> yeah. Um, who did you say directed this one? Uh, this one was directed by a guy named Alexander Witt. Yeah. Um, do we know, do we know anything? Well, he, I don't know that he uh, has directed anything else notably, but he was a second unit director and a cinematographer on movies that you have seen, such as Speed, Twister, Gladiator, Hannibal, Black Hawk Down, Born Identity, Casino Royale, Skyfall, Avengers Infinity War, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of big stuff. So many of my favorites. Yeah. So this was his opportunity to direct because I think, um, I think. So this one goes right up there with him, right, Holly? Smile. <laughs> <laughs> I think this Stay one may because this yeah I, I uh, I'm trying to think like what Paul Anderson was doing in 2002 but it might have been like he had to do Soldier or something he's like I'm not going to get typecast yeah. with uh, have I seen that movie Kurt Russell Soldier yeah no yeah, I've seen it no too. yeah you're not missing much um. So, uh, um, you know, and also both, uh, both leading ladies in both those series married the guy who directed them. Um, yeah, I mean, and they both kind of, they ran out the same year it was the, the final yeah. episode of both of them and both of them also, ironically, um, I remember looking at like the box office grosses of both of those, uh, you know, cause it was blood wars underworld, right. And the final chapter of resident evil, which scored the lowest, um, 
box office in the United States of the entire each series, but globally they were huge. I mean, they, these and that's the thing. I guess they they perform extremely well uh, to a global uh, market, you know, where everybody's just like. That just, has to be why they keep getting made, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Oh yeah. So uh, Mila Jovovich um, is the star of the Resident Evil series. Well, What's her name? Pass. What? What's her name? Lilu? Alice. I was gonna Alice. Say, Alice. She says it over Alice, a character who does not exist in Resident Evil whatsoever. Yeah, my name really? is Alice. Nope. No, no, not at all. The, they, they, like Colin said, the first movie, there's literally no character from the video game series upon which. Oh, I thought you meant like they just didn't use any of the side characters, but she's not in it at all. No. 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 Okay, I can. I can see why people would be a little upset about that. Well, that makes, and this, that, that makes more sense. This is why I watched the first one and never watched another one. <laughs> Yeah, because you go like, I'm here for Resident Evil, and like, what the hell does this have to do with anything? I remember reading the synopsis when they were making Resident Evil, and it was like, a team of commandos infiltrates a secret underground base and uh, runs into a homicidal computer. And you're like, this is called Resident Evil? What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But they did it. Barely recognizable. They did because the main antagonist awesome. is called the Red Queen. It's a, a killer computer program. Was it turns out the little girl that you saw in this movie is the basis of the Red Queen from the other one, and that keeps going in the the future sequels. There's a lot of interconnected stuff. People in this movie show up like four movies down the line will reappear, like the same actor. Like Ian yeah. Glenn is in this movie at the very end. Um, and then he shows up as the main antagonist in Resident Evil Six. I mean, they keep on characters. Jill Valentine shows back up in like number four. Michelle Rodriguez is in the first one. She's in like the 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 fifth one. <laughs> you know, is, is Jill Jill Valentine is the one in this one? The girl with the brown hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah in the blue okay. top. Yeah, so Jill Valentine. I think that's okay. why they focus we, on her so much. For a second, we need to we need to talk about the in the impractical. The logic costume. Of the tube top. Why would you movie? wear a tube top in a zombie apocalypse? You don't wear a tube top. You know how much she would be tugging that up constantly, <laughs> all the time, tugging that Didn't shit up. Happened once. Well, and not to mention, like, if like the threat is zombie bites, you should be as covered as possible, right? You be wearing head to toe leather, right? Yeah. I would think this is. Yeah. You should be wearing underworld shit. Yeah. I mean, we are coming into this where she has no idea what is going on. Like, she doesn't know zombie. She doesn't know if you get bit, no, no, you, you turn into one. I don't. I don't agree with that though. She's at home. She's at home watching the news, and she sees what's happening. She's like, "Oh, I'm gonna throw in my tube top and go downtown." <laughs> I think, uh, Sean. I think. Yeah, I know. You're you're right, Colin. Because she does burst into the police station. And shoot him in the head. And yeah. Like, I told you, shoot him in the head. And she's been fired, which is what happens to her after the first video game. So I think we're picking up with her sometime after the events of the original Resident Evil video game, if they exist in the same world. That's Jill Valentine in the original vi- video game there that I'm showing everybody a little photo yeah. of what she looks she, like. Guess what? She has sleeves. Yeah. She looks like Stallone in Demolition Man. She does. She's got the beret and everything going. And, she better uh, be really good at shooting with one hand because the other one's going to be pulling that shit up. That's the <laughs> reimagined Jill Valentine from the latest uh, version, which again still looks more street credible than what we get in the Resident Evil Apocalypse, which is the sexy Jill Valentine wearing the tube top and the uh, what was it like? It's not a skirt; it's some kind of like two thousand era it's a half skirt. pants, half skirt kind of thing. She looks the most like a Japanese video game character for sure. She really does. She really does. Yeah. That's true. They, uh, she does have uh, uh, a hoodie wrapped around her waist. That's so, what, maybe know, that's what it was? She, she, she gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> my my headcanon is that she like pissed her pants or something and is trying to cover it up. <laughs> <laughs> she saw zombies shit herself and she's like, well, <laughs> yep. can't get home to change. And everyone's like, hey, why don't you put that hoodie on? You know, tube top's not very practical. And she's like, oh, no, no I'm, I'm good. Fine, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm not cold at all. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, she's got a. Well, I mean, this is the. That's a part of that fan service, right? I mean, they bring in several of the monsters from the different video games. Uh, you yes, got to have. Letters. 
yeah, the liquor, which is the big, uh, like skinless looking, uh, guy with the brain exposed and the long tongue that they encounter at one point. Uh, there's the nemesis, which is the antagonist of resident evil three that follows you through the entire video game and is fairly terrifying. Um, yes, they bring in, uh, well, I think it's just Jill and Carlos. So the only video game characters in here. They make a reference to the Ashford family, which is the one that founded the Umbrella Corporation, but you wouldn't get that really out of the movies. I thought Ian Glenn should have been cast as Wesker, right? Uh, The big bad. That'd have been good. Because eventually they get another guy in the next. That makes no sense to anybody else on this podcast. Yeah. Wesker. Albert Wesker. Um, He's like the head of the Umbrella. Or he like me. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, Too complicated. So. uh, (laughs) He's he's one of the main bad guys of the series. Um, so this one plunks us down. So in the first one, basically, after they uh, encounter this uh, evil killer robot and zombies get loose and there's an outbreak Damn, in, y'all froze. in the hive beneath oh, uh, you- Raccoon City. Sean, are you there? Can you hear us? I'm, I'm back. Okay. okay. We're okay. Skype you issues tonight. away for a minute. Um, right, cool. <laughs> but uh, I think we lost Michaela. I'm no, she's there. Okay. There you go. Just maybe frozen. Uh, um, so after after that's happened in the first movie, right? Um, then we're setting up that a character from there, uh, this guy named Matt, is going to become the nemesis. You know, at the end of that movie, it's like you take him away and make him bring him into the nemesis project. So this film, that's, that's the big monster guy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all of these movies, uh, all the, the Resident Evil story revolves around the release or development of a thing called the T virus, um, which is created by the evil Umbrella Corporation. Um, like Skynet, but with zombies. Yeah. Well, they make like pharmaceuticals. Uh, yeah, I think primarily more chemicals and stuff, and then they just kind of take over the world. Yeah. So this bio, is a uh, biochemical the- Skynet. Yeah, and then they're like by and large from uh, uh, Wally. Like they're just a, they do a little bit of everything. They make pretty much everything, and they take over your life. Yeah, because sure. aren't they also like government contractors or defense contractors and stuff like that? And they work with different, yeah. you know, uh, different governments to do different things. Um, which actually reminds me, there was a trailer for this movie. Uh, which was pretty famous at the time that you probably saw, but it was like a makeup commercial. You remember this? It like it was talking about regenerate. It was like this product that yep. you put on your skin and it would make your skin uh, turn dead things to life. Or we bring dead things to life or something like that. And uh, then that was directed by uh, Marcus Nispel, the guy who did the Texas Chainsaw remake and Friday the 13th remake. Uh, he yep. did that, but that commercial like was one of the most, uh, downloaded commercials i think of that you know movie trailers and built up the anticipation for this movie and everybody saw it and i'm surprised it's not like in the end credits of the movie or whatever which uh, you know really go-, commercial- go ahead Hi, Dolly. i was gonna say it just really goes against what actual beauty regiments encourage because you want to get rid of the dead the top the top layer you want to exfoliate and get but what rid if of you that? could just bring it back to life back. you don't want to bring it back you want to get rid of that it's see smooth- i want <laughs> I want Holly as 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 they're playing the Resident Evil commercial. I want Holly's to like buzz in and break into the broadcast. <laughs> like, no, that's wrong. You want to <laughs> the dead skin, and then it'd be a commercial for the people killing the zombies and shit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. He could be a member make, of Stars. I'm gonna make you a star, Holly. Yeah. <laughs> or the BSAA, which I think is what Stars becomes, or something after uh, after the Raccoon City incident, or whatever the hell. Um, I don't know. You so know, that, that plot is not unlike the plot of Catwoman, right? <laughs> so you're saying it's a good thing we didn't go there. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think it is a good thing that that stayed where it was. <laughs> well, the um, so the plot of this movie basically this is I think this is one of the only of this series. This movie has a lot going on uh, right out of the gate, so much so that we don't even get to see uh, new footage of Mila Jovovich until about, I don't know, it felt like 15 minutes into the movie or something yeah, like that. Like 20 long. minutes in. Yeah. That long. Because there's, uh, they're going to go back in and uh, Umbrella's going to go in and reopen the hive. Uh, the, the virus gets loose and the scale 
gets huge. And I still think that even though later Resident Evil movies use a lot of CG, you know, wide shots of cities burning and, you know, CG zombies all over the place, this one is still in that era where if you were going to do that stuff, you had to do it for real. And so they shot in Toronto and, you know, we've got, you know, hundreds of people on a bridge, you know, that they're being uh, locked out as they're sealing off the city. I always love the one you can do that in movies, uh, build a wall around the city to contain it in the matter of like 12 hours or something like that. Right. When the outbreak's yeah, happening real quick, never, you can't underestimate the umbrella corporation. They can just do anything. They got they're satellites. everywhere, man. They're dug in like ticks. Yeah. They're probably under your town right now. You don't even know it. There's a secret underground base under there where they're doing some kind of crazy experimentation. You know what? Resident that Evil. Would, that would explain Rockford. <laughs> Resident Evil is kind yeah. of like a mixture of. Um, there's a little bit of like David Cronenberg, right? With science gone amok. There's a little, a lot of the thing, especially in the later ones. And I think that's what I feel the. Like you're uh, giving it a lot of credit. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think, no, I mean, the actual concept, I think this is why it's so strong. I think uh, um, it merges the gothic with like the um, biological horror. Um, the idea itself is like really cool, you know, as a theme to keep exploring with these uh, video games. I think that's why everybody keeps coming back to them. Um, how well it's achieved in the movies, like I said, you know, all of this stuff yeah, I don't is. don't think the execution is there. <laughs> yeah. Although this one does, do they go back to gothic? Because that's not in this. Like those elements that are kind of key in the in the in the games are just gone from now. Again, I've only seen two out of these six movies, but does it come back at all? Because it doesn't look like it. Looks like we go to a desert and then fucking Antarctica at some point. Yeah, it uh, hops all over the globe, but and it's mostly post-apocalyptic. The rest of the series um, is after, like everyone on Earth has been wiped out by the virus. This is the only one that really employs like uh, gothic cathedrals, uh, zombies coming out of graves, zombies in cemeteries, mm-hmm. zombies in you know uh, smoky city night streets and stuff like that. Um, I did. I know it was very brief, but I actually did appreciate the classic imagery of the zombies coming out of the grave. I don't know why. I just always love that. And maybe it's nostalgia. I don't know. It was like the one the zombie coming out of a grave, right? Like it's... I just don't like the way that rubs up against this like early two thousands Japanese video game aesthetic. You know, I don't oh, like no, the it way makes... they clash together. You know, yeah, no, it makes no sense and it's totally out of place. But I was like, oh. They still did it. <laughs> well, the later like, how ones. How did that virus get to the corpses underground? Uh, oh. Right. Well, Water see, supply? It leaches yes. in. The, didn't you see Return of the Living Dead? It you comes into the rain. You get on this shit. It's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Chromium. We have to find the chromium. <laughs> Holly, that's the movie I want to watch. The Aaron Brockovich case that's happening in the midst of all this in Raccoon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know that's going on somewhere. There's some. Uh, well, we had a reporter character in this one, right? There's like 50 characters in this movie. Um, each one and they're occupying, all forgettable. What? and they're occupying their own like little pockets of. There's like the there's Carlos and his SWAT team, right? Of stars, they're dropped into the city after containment fails and uh, monsters are everywhere. Jared Harris. Did, you, did anyone else get like some like Carl Urban vibes? Yeah, he could have. I mean, that, yeah, those guys are bit. interchangeable. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, then you got uh, Jared Harris works for the bad guys, right? With Umbrella Corporation. The chief bad guy is Thomas Kretschmann, the German actor playing some guy named Kane. I have no idea, but he's, you know. Sure, yeah. Um, but um, I think um, Jared Harris's character of Charles Ashford is a guy who actually created the T virus in order to help his uh, crippled daughter regain the use of her legs. And then suddenly turns out, but if you apply that thing to dead people, it brings them back to life. And so she's stuck inside the, the, the city he's on the outside. And so he wants to get her back. So he recruits uh, through by hacking everything. He's able to get uh, Jill Valentine and her crew, which are in the city somewhere. And, um, Alice, who's wandering around, she's escaped from a facility where they took her to experiment on her again. So you got, what is that, four different groups, and we have to somehow try and bring all these narratives together. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. <laughs> the what? 
said somehow somehow how do they do it together. yeah well how do they bring these people together uh through sheer um force of having them show up in the next scene yeah <laughs> that's it well this is the staple of those uh 2000 era- i guess we're partners now mm. that's it yeah pretty much that's well, all they do. They show up in a scene. It's like, ah, oh, well, you're human. I guess we're together in this. Well, they. I mean, uh, I guess, I guess that would be the standard like zombie apocalypse, like survival method. If you find other people that are surviving, you stick together, right? Not like safety in numbers situation, especially if some of them have guns and training. Sure. Is anyone that doesn't have guns in this movie? Uh, no. Did the reporter have a gun? Yeah, they give her one. At one she's, point. She's the one who oh, yeah. uh, disregards any kind of safety. I think when she's approaching the little girl, she has the gun like pointed at her. Uh, Jill Valentine gives her a gun and says like, eh, it's no big deal. And she's like, I've never shot a gun before. She's like, eh, just make sure you shoot him in the head. No big deal. And she never will. There's nothing to it. Yeah. I, why? I, I, I missed something. Why did they separate? Why are these people so stupid? Uh, you got to check the basement, man. And the upper floors, and you can cover more ground and. Yeah, you know how it works. You don't need to. You don't need to. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that Ashford calls them all individually because he can hack the pay phones and he makes them all deals that they're going to go in and find his daughter. And she's at the school. So when they show up with each other at the school, they're like, oh, you got the call too. And so that's why you're here. And so now we're partners splitting this money or whatever reward that he's going to give us, which I think is just right. basically a seat on the plane to get the fuck out and survive the thing. Of course, there's a time limit because the government's going to sterilize the whole town. You've seen this trope before where they're going to send the nuclear missile, which I like that, you know, uh, Alice is like, you know, they're going to send the a nuclear bomb. And Jill's first response is, what's the yield? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, uh, what, that, what's the difference between like, <laughs> uh, if she had said like eight megatons instead of 14, would she have had a different reaction? Like, what the fuck does it matter? It's a nuke. Yeah. Right. Which, I mean, these are the things that are going through your head when you're like, yeah, right. Oh shit. What's the yield? I mean, I asked that question about different things throughout the day, but, <laughs> oh man, what's the yield? Yeah. <laughs> so they have to fight through, uh, different, uh, you know, um, uh, masses of, uh, zombies. Um, fight scenes happen all the time in this movie because uh, Alice has been given some type of uh, the T virus. It turns out has actually grafted with her in a way that it doesn't graft with anybody else and gives her superhuman abilities. These, of course, are taken away from her in subsequent movies, but right now she's got this superhuman power. Um, so she can jump real high and do a bunch of spin kicks in a row and. Do crazy, yeah. I mean, run down the side of a building. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it. Yeah. I like that she uh, somehow, it also gives her intuition. I'm just using one example, but I'm sure the movie is full of them where Jill and the little, the little girl, Angela, are trapped in a classroom. Jill's like, How are we going to get out of here? And uh, the zombies are coming. So she uh, turns on the gas, right? And then as she's leaving, she's going to light a book of matches and throw it in there and blow the thing up but the air the wind of the thing falling like extinguishes the flame but when they open the front door alice is standing there with a lit cigarette like she's ready she's been preparing for this how did she know what the plan was (laughs) t-virus i mean they kind Uh, of like at the very end of the movie talk about like whatever that bullshit explanation was about if you take this one thing, it regenerates this. And like, it kind of alluded to the fact that it gives you like special powers, which to me was some bullshit, but I don't know. But I don't know. I can't get my head around the logic of this movie. because I don't think there is any, I think it only works with her. The special, because by the end of the movie, she's like psychic, right? Yeah. Right. But didn't she say the little girl had some ability or something at the end? Yeah, because like she, she is also uh, a wash apparently in the T virus. It is also bonded with her in some way, but they never talk about her as being like some super secret weapon. But didn't they say she could like regenerate or something? Yeah, that's why she can walk because yeah. she yeah. used to be you know, crippled or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like the- Wolverine and the little girl on Logan. 
Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean another movie where we're escorting a child that has a specialty from point A to point B? I know. Can yes. you believe that Logan copied Resident Evil the two and did it better? I'm, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because that's not a trope that's as old as time. Yeah, it's I mean, never been done. I think that goes it's back to uh, sleep too, Colin. Yeah, but it's primarily. <laughs> I think the biggest or best example of that is probably Aliens. You know, the idea that you have the warrior who finds the, uh, you know the paternal instinct is motivated by finding the, the kid, right. Who replaces a kid that didn't exist or remind you of you when you were younger or whatever the hell. Um, it, there's so many examples of that story that like, you can really just find your favorite version of it. Yeah. yeah. Choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Colin, mm -hmm. you don't get to bring up aliens again while we're talking about resident <laughs> evil. That's your last one. Okay. Because of we how many times that, uh, Paul Anderson rips it off. I mean, this guy is an, I mean, and I'm saying that he wrote it, but I mean, there's all these allusions to aliens throughout like his filmography. I mean, including the fact that he did one, right. Aliens versus predator. Um, but he is like a, uh, he's a, well, I would call him a ripoff artist. Other people call him a, uh, he does homages and right. And somehow that, you know, he's making, comments on these other movies by absorbing them and using them in his work or call outs to him in his work. I was shocked and surprised as I was doing research for this movie where I happened to look on letterboxd, which is a site if you know it, that uh, where all these reviews are for movies. And I looked up some of the resident evil, later resident evil movies, just as I'm seeing four star reviews of all of these movies. And they're talking about Paul Anderson as some kind of like uh, punk, a genius and cinematic stylist and his use of geometric editing. And they call up a Fritz Lang or uh Louis Bunuel, the surrealist oh when described. And I'm like, I can't tell right. If these are all jokes, I took Probably. them as jokes, <laughs> but I'm also like, is there like a cult of Paul W S Anderson going on here that I don't know. About? I'm like, <laughs> sure there is somewhere, but Jesus it's like uh, George Millet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And lighting. This is like German new wave. Yeah. I mean, my experience with letterbox reviews is people try to be as snarky as they can in as few sentences as possible. So I'm going to assume those are all trolling comments. They or were. they're or they're just weird fanatics that just took a film class. Yeah. Yeah, that that's possible. Contrarians. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. they've clearly taken film studies because they're just the way that, you know, you got to read some of them. I'm telling you, any of the Resident Evil movies, well, just the most recent. You can and still troll someone. You yeah. Would it, be, would it be more entertaining <laughs> than this series? I have to ask. Like, is that where we need to go? Instead of watching anymore, <laughs> should I just go read the letterbox? Well, here's the thing that happens with, so there's an interesting evolution that happens, right? You got to see the first. Is there? Yeah. The first three okay. movies are basically one set of a trilogy and even though there's continuity throughout and the second set of three is a different uh thing because what happened in there was resident evil 4 and resident evil 5 came out and those two games as sean was talking about earlier it uh introduced like the uh uh this um the parasite infection the Las plagas uh thing yeah. And so basically then it wasn't so much about a virus that brings dead things back to life, but it actually mutates uh, and gives you all, you know, and so then you get these giant monsters of all sorts of weird, you played Japanese video games, all sorts of weird con bodily configurations of these things. Yeah. And this is giants. what I'm saying. This, yeah. There's the, the, the thing uh, element to it, blobby fleshy things with tentacles and yeah, they're horrible nightmare things. And so Paul Anderson reconfigured his approach to the movies using that logic to the later ones. So you get, uh, you know, they get away from zombies and go more towards just like, you know, weirdo, uh, monsters and stuff like that. And he incorporates, you know, a bunch of them from the games, but a lot of the, uh, that imagery there. So are they more entertaining? And I'm going to leave to the letterbox crowd. Best idea, to, probably. Yeah, you'll have to find out by going there. And he also pioneered, pioneered, he was one of the pioneers along with James Cameron of uh, the 3D technology because I think Resident Evil Afterlife, the fourth one, was shot with, the, I think the fourth and the fifth one maybe were shot uh, with the, uh, whatever, the Fusion 3D camera. 
And yeah. at the time it was like, it was kind of a cool, you know, they actually framed stuff up. I was like, Oh, it's actually like cool 3d, which they totally forget by the time they get to the, the fifth one. It looks pretty flat <laughs> even in 3d. You own, you own these in 3d Colin. Of course I do. Sean. Of course you do. Some of us have, you know, have to collect all the goddamn tremors movies. Some of us have to collect the Evil Dead. <laughs> I keep getting beat down with the Oh, boy. Or not the Evil Dead, the Resident Evils. Um, yeah. So uh, this movie culminates with a big uh, mano y mano brawl between Alice and the nemesis. Um, How would you think they pulled off the representation of this character uh, in translation from the video game? <laughs> <laughs> his feet are I was say, I'm pretty sure that question's for you, Sean. <laughs> uh, I think so. His uh it's a little weird. I mean, the, they're definitely using uh camera angles to their advantage in this because uh in the games the nemesis is huge. Uh, he's a big guy. In this, they're they're taking a six foot seven actor, putting him in uh, uh makeup. So he he his proportions seem a little off. If you look close, he's wearing like l- big boots with lifts in them when he's walking around and he, he's got like a regular human sized uh, body, but his arms and head are bigger. I don't know. I, it's not, I, I appreciate they did it practically, but he looks a little goofy. Would you say he looked I like mean, a cross between pumpkin head and a Cenobite? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a little bit it, like Goro from Mortal Kombat. Little yeah. Bit. Oh, yeah. If you told me they repurposed the Goro animatronic, I, w- I believe it. But now that you I mean, say it's that, I see it. basically just like the nemesis. So I'll give him that. Yeah. But he's still a little goofy looking. I think this was, like I oh, said, this was the overcorrection to like, they said that there was, you know, no uh, relatable elements from the, the video games in the first movie. So this yeah. one, I'm going to give you some characters and the main antagonist of one of them, that, you know, the memorable thing. Yeah. Um, I was. Su- I have a question about an earlier scene. So when they were in that like kitchen with all the like mute mutated dogs attacking them, uh, okay, some of those dogs looked real, some of them looked like CG. What was happening there? And like, clearly, whatever it was, they weren't confident because it was all in shadow, and you never really got like a full look at the dogs. But yeah. So what what I get from this is that the do- all the dogs are real, but I'm betting because all the makeup on the dogs is real. They did that for the first one and this one, but I'm betting they shot these dogs on a green screen and overlaid them within the movie. Okay. So real dog, but just green screened into the movie. We don't even have to, they well, weird. they do like, yeah. they do CG overlays. Like they do have, uh, the dogs are wearing costumes because I've seen behind yeah. the scenes stuff where they're pulling skin tight stuff over <laughs> the dogs. Um, but then they're also, you know, like one of them has the filmy eye, you know, and half the face is missing. Then that's your, yeah. and because I remember that was actually the thing when I saw the original, 2002 resident evil like i'm saying i hadn't seen zombies in movies for like what is that like 15 years or something prior to that and the thing that all of a sudden stood out to me was i think there was one part where a zombie turned around and half the face was missing like actually and i'm like wow this is you know with cg has changed the game with zombie movies because it used to be you always had to add on and then sculpt away but now you can just like take half of a person's face off. And I'm like, Oh wow, we're going to somewhere uh, completely different. So that's an extension of that. You're just, you know, sculpting away at them at like a CG overlay on some right. of them. Sometimes they looked really good. And other times they, they did not. But the fact that you never really saw them in any sort of like full light, I was like, okay, so they're, they're covering something by doing that. Well, also, think- you can't have like a commercial kitchen full of stainless steel with a kid hiding from a creature and not make us think of Jurassic park. Right, which had <laughs> yeah. been released at this point. Sure. Like I said, there's a, this. These are not in any way uh, brave, exciting new <laughs> frontiers <laughs> of filming. They're yeah. relying heavily on tropes of other things that you've seen, uh, just basically to barrel head, bar- barrel ahead with the action scenes. Although I don't think that's the thing that I don't think uh, Alexander Witt. Um, and if I'm going to give any credit to Paul Anderson, I'll say his later, the later entries in the series do have. Uh, better constructed fight scenes where you can actually see what's happening. I hope so, because Jesus Christ, that last fight scene with the nemesis was one of the worst things I've ever seen. You're saying in the cutting. In the cutting. Yeah. Because that's, again, because I'm sure if they just let it happen, 
the nemesis was going to look a little goofy getting in a fist fight with Alice. And so in the cutting, man, they, they cut that thing to shreds. And there's all close ups too. It seemed like, yeah. you know, where the later oh. ones, you know, a good fight scene that has good choreography, you can cover from uh, fairly wide camera shots. Uh, I think an unconfident action director does, they do all do the same thing. You get three cameras running at the same time, right? You got your wide, you got your medium that's usually following the action. And then you get like the super close that's following the action. Right. And then you're just cutting between all three of those in some kind, you know, to try and make a rhythm out of it because yeah. you know, other, so otherwise you'd see people pulling punches and whatever, but from this angle, man, it looked like he, you know, uh, but <laughs> right. yeah, if, if they don't know what they're doing, I think they just rely on that. Cause like, well, that's how it's done, which I think is what's happening here. It's like the director's yeah. just going, this is the technique that you used to, to do this. Um, but then they have to make it up in the, in the editing room. And it's like, you're actually disguising the fact that you don't have the goods, you know, it's like the, the yeah. it didn't look good on the set and you're trying to make it look good, you know, in the editor. That editor must've been exhausted after getting done with that. Well, apparently uh, they employ the uh, guy who shot stuff with uh, who's the, the crank team, um, the ghost Rider two guys, Neville Dean and Taylor gamer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They employ his editor for the later movies. And the, which is what, you know, again, I learned from letterbox and the geometry of his, <laughs> uh, his, uh, avant-garde editing in the resident evil movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, scholarly papers need to be written oh, about, boy. about resident evil. The movie keeps going after the nemesis is defeated for like another 10 minutes. It's amazing. This movie like never runs out of stuff to do. <laughs> it felt like another 20 minutes, maybe another 20 it minutes did. where I could not believe how much longer this was going on after that. Well, Seriously, at that scene, I was like, oh, this movie was pretty short. And then it had another movie. It was 20 minutes of the next movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's set up for it the next movie. It feels like that's what they do. Well, this is what the Resident Evil movies do. They always, they cap off the movie before it with a scene at the beginning, which again, I do believe those do get better with in, in these interesting <laughs> opening credit scenes. Then, and they all start with the, my name is, my name is Alice speech and the recap of everything that's happened up till now. Then you get the main body of the movie, which usually traps you know people in a, a you know a one environment big environment and then you get the setup for the the next movie at the very end so you got to keep coming back every two years into the oh, world yeah. of resident evil they made millions of dollars worldwide millions so the answer <laughs> is ultimately yes there's a massive appetite for this kind of thing <laughs> uh, are you sure people didn't just fall asleep from exhaustion until the next movie came into the theater and then we're just there for it. Well, that's I, well, I mean, what, two years later and they woke up and they're like, Hey, the new yes. one's out. <laughs> yes. That's what I think happened. Yeah. They were so exhausted. They just fell asleep until the new one came out. Thought it was the one they were watching. Stuck with it. Yeah, they are exhausting. I mean, I'll tell you with the underworld movies, I think when I watched those last two, uh, I watched resident evil and underworld, the final chapters of each, relatively close together and just was like wow the underworld movie actually does have like characters and a story whereas the resident evil movies just have plot you know <laughs> and it's like who knows yeah. who these people are or what they want or what they're doing oh she's got a daughter now oh there's a bunch of clones oh i think she actually died in this movie because there's clones in her and all well, right there's clones in the next one <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think well, that her getting else in the helicopter survive are they clones too uh tell us colin we'll never watch another one uh i'm trying to remember if carlos i think is in the next one as they're all moving through like the post-apocalypse and then have to uh you know eventually converge on a it rips off a lot of day of the dead and they end up uh, it's a complicated plot it makes no sense it just keeps i mean you're just basically stacking incidents and fight scenes and car chases and you know yeah and eventually Leon Kennedy does show up because they do that. They bring in like Chris Redfield is Wentworth Miller plays him in uh, the fourth one afterlife. Leon Kennedy oh. and Ada Wong show up and Barry show up in the, oh, the sixth so one. Barry shows up. Did Barry show up for one scene and die? Cause I hope so. No, but he, he does die and he does bring out his big ass gun. So, I mean, okay. it's, it, these movies work as complete total fan service. If you're in the world, you know, if you play these game games and know them inside and out, there's an added level of interest when you actually watch the movies. Right. 
but we're going to have to hear from Holly to find out how it played <laughs> to uh, <laughs> just someone coming in off the street to Resident yeah. Evil. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's what are we watching here? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you feel about that, Holly? Well, all right. I'm curious. Well, in order to get to Holly's review, we're all going to go around the room and tell you what we thought about Resident Evil Apocalypse. I'm going to like dub in the actual voice there. They stopped doing that in the video games. That's so great. Resident Evil. They did. Evil. I think it stopped at three. Five. Resident Evil. No, they did it for six. Resident oh, Evil. They? Six. Yeah. They didn't Stars. do it in seven. I know it's kind of disappointing in the remake. He doesn't sound as good as he does in the video in the movie. <laughs> Stars or whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to need to summon our mailman. His name's Igor. Uh, bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why? Thank you, Igor. He's got his little Resident Evil tube top on. Yeah. (laughs) And the beret. (laughs) He just goes, freaks. (laughs) (laughs) That's perfect. I'll put some reverb on that and you'll you'll be all (laughs) set. Yeah. Um, well, we want you to, we want to hear from you and, uh, we want, uh, Igor to bring us some of your mail and the way that you can get a hold of us is you can follow along on Facebook, facebook.com slash I freak show. We're also on Twitter. That's that freak show. And you can email us. Saturday night freak show at yahoo.com. Or you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday night freak show. Uh, let's see here. First of all about tonight's movie, resident evil. Apocalypse. Uh, B movie poster vault says, I think it's telling that I literally had to go to Wikipedia to remember if I saw this film. I hadn't, as it's the type of franchise that follows up Apocalypse with Extinction and its naming schedule, even though there's three more films to crap out afterwards. I found the first film terminally dull, the third film entertainingly dumb, and ignored the rest of the series. Even House of the Dead, at least, had the ability to be laughably bad, not unforgivably bland. We have to wait to see what right. the, the free show crew thing. Uh, correct. Brent Zemecki says this is the closest of the movies to the games. If it wasn't for some bad writing and Alice being forced down our throats, it might have actually been good. Still, probably my second favorite of the series, though. Uh, Travis Legler writes in says, with a Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, Child's Play, and the Halloween movie series, I can tell each movie apart and explain why they all feel different, even though the critics may say they're the same. However, with this movie series, I feel like they're so interchangeable, I really struggle to remember which one is which. They're not horrible movies by any means, just sometimes slightly forgettable. Absolutely. Simon Carter says, I I think this movie was subtitled Yawn of the Dead. The first Resident Evil was okay, but I couldn't get on board with any of the sequels. I think I gave up entirely after three. Uh, Grant Parrish. I like Yawn of the Dead. I, 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 I feel like, like that. that joke's been said on here before. Has it? I think so. Somebody mailed in. <laughs> Maybe he just keeps uh, emailing the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> it works, man. It works. Yeah, it works. <laughs> well, uh, Grant Parrish talking about Mila Jovovich, uh, the woman who uh, has basically probably set up a trust fund for her kids and can live off of these movies forever. She was, by the way, in 2006 named the VH, VH1 reigning queen of kick butt. Uh, he says, I just watched her in Paradise Hills, and I can say for a fact, you guys aren't wor- watching the worst Mila Jovovich movie, so that's something. I hope they give her a plaque with that on it. Something. Oh, I'm sure she has it. The reigning queen sure, of kick butt? She, yeah, I hope she has that hung up in her yeah. uh, house. It was an award, the VH1 award. Yeah. Uh, Michael Whitaker says, the first and last of this franchise, it's kind of good. Oh, he's talking about this one. He says, I wasn't much of a video game person when the movie came out, and I only had a passing understanding of the games. I can kind of wave away a lot of the stupidity in this movie, but the one thing that always gets me is the fact that Raccoon City is not some podunk town in the mountains with two gas stations and one stoplight, but rather some bustling metropolis like New York City. I just don't buy it. Yeah. That's a good point. It was never that big. It is in the, yeah, in the the remakes. It's a major. Right, but I get what he's saying, like a town that or a city that size wouldn't be called fucking raccoon city that sounds like some right. fucking backwoods texas small town what was the name of the the raven's great gate bridge raven's gate bridge uh, like yeah names uh, raven's 
Yeah, Raven's Gate. Yeah, it was something like that. Gateway. The Raven's Gate yeah. Bridge. I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh, about last week's movie, we watched a movie called Dread. Uh, Jacob Laws writes in and says, in a way, this was a Die Hard remake and a very good Die Hard remake at that. I can see that. Sure. I don't see that sure. at all. Yeah. It's thin. Okay, it's, it's thin. pretty thin. It takes place in a building. Well, okay. That is true. Um, about the, off the building. That's true. That is also true. Wow. Mm. All right. Well, we're two for two. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the previous week, we watched a movie called Steel Dawn. That was with uh, Patrick Swayze. <laughs> How was that, by the way? Well, you got to listen to our episode. not pleasant, Sean. <laughs> I mean, my husband's watched Roadhouse twice since then to try to forget it. So That's a good, <laughs> yeah, good man. That's the way you do it. Just watch some <laughs> Roadhouse on a loop. Um, well, anyway, we were talking about that uh, basically Steel Dawn is a sci-fi remake of Shane. Brett Williams says, I'm just catching up with this episode while listening. I knew Shane from 1953 was a book first in 1949 from author Jack Schaefer because we actually had to read Shane for high school English and then watched Alan Ladd and Jack Plants and Shane afterwards. I see the story was originally published in the periodical Argosy in July of 1946. So it's probably safe to assume that he was not exposed to samurai films at that point and the gunfighter running from his past trope likely originates with him. Good call. Yeah. He's dropping some learning on us. You know, I had yeah, a thought while listening to that episode, and I remember we were talking about Logan and other movies that have like aped the idea of Shane. But what makes yeah. Logan better is even though and in Logan, it, they play Shane on uh, the TV, mm-hmm. right. To acknowledge yeah. the debt. But it's not, it's basically saying that's what the character is like. The character is the gunfighter who wants to give it up that finds another, re- but they're not remaking the plot. You know what I mean? Logan's right. plot doesn't ma- mirror Shane. Steel Dawn is so close that it should have had a written by Jack Schaefer credit on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Carson Snar says, looks like, uh, okay, so Christopher Neem in the movie is the main bad guy, and he has something that looks like, I don't know, a dead, gigantic porcupine on his head. And Carson Snar said, it looks like if anime hair was shown in real life. That's basically <laughs> what that guy's hair looks like. That is a good way like to put it. it. It's very pointy. So that Japanese yeah. crowd. Um, maybe, may, maybe Japanese video games are inspired by Steel Dawn. They grew up with that stuff. What was that, 87? Could have been Fist of the North Star or whatever. No, uh, what's that? Uh, Final Fantasy. Looking at you. It, it would be uh, wild to find out that like a whole country thinks Steel Dawn it like molded their culture. Wouldn't that be crazy? That would be crazy <laughs> and there's somehow little, awesome. There's little pockets out there. It's one of those tribes that's never like had human contact except for <laughs> Steel Dawn, <laughs> and so that's how they like, live. Like in Joe versus the volcano with that tribe in the island that likes orange soda. Yes. It's like they have no modern technology at all, but they love orange soda. Yeah. yeah. Or, or it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like Galaxy yeah. Quest. Like Galaxy <laughs> Quest. They've seen the episodes and they're like, this is uh, this is real. This is how we've modeled our life. Can yeah. you imagine modeling your whole society around like arguably the worst Patrick Swayze movie? <laughs> yeah, but if you don't know any different, I mean, what do you got to do? You just uh, build yeah. the chicken but wire houses. If they and- did see a good Swayze movie, would they like it or would they hate it? But maybe that maybe their society would be the better version of Steel Dawn. Maybe they have actual like motor car jousting, and they can sheathe their swords properly. Yes, <laughs> I, I want to see the people who live in fear of shadow ghosts. First of all. <laughs> yes. That's yes. that's yes. the society. Shadow ghosts. That's the society I want to see. <laughs> well, the final comment we got here on Steel Dawn is Novato Judoka wrote in and said, "This is the only movie I can think of that would have been better if you had actually cast Hulk Hogan instead of making Brian James dress up as the serial brand version of him." The Brian. crazy Hulk Hogan faces might have made it more entertaining. It would fit in with that like fake Mad Maxian universe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. His over the topness might have made it more entertaining. Right. I, I I I say go a step even further. I say cast uh, Hulk Hogan instead of Patrick Swayze. I think you could have made a better movie. But oh my hey. god, I'd watch the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it'd be more fitting to that character. I think, but uh, we just have Suburban Commando. Yeah, okay, then. that's true. 
Um, so now we're going to go around the room, tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, resident evil apocalypse, starting Ali. with. Ali, we'll start with you this, this time. Uh, what do you think about tonight's movie? Resident evil apocalypse. Do you feel like the apocalypse happened to you? Um, no, because I feel like the apocalypse would be more eventful. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start with this. So I, I, I've mentioned this to you guys before, but I'm going to mention it to our listeners. Back in the day when Phantom Menace came out, I read our local paper and the, the film critic loose term there started the article with as someone who's never seen a star Wars movie. And that's where I stopped reading the article because <laughs> fuck that. I don't care what you think. So. With that said, if you are a massive Resident Evil fan and you don't give a shit about my opinion, I fully understand because I know nothing about these movies, the video games, the comics, anything. I and until we started talking, I forgot the main character's name was Alice. I <laughs> know nothing. I know nothing. So, if you do not give a shit what I think, I fully understand and I appreciate your opinion. So, with that said, this movie sucked ass and I never want to watch it again. <laughs> I have no interest in watching any other Resident Evil movie or play a video game or read anything about it. I think it was a devastating version of a zombie movie. No, it's not a zombie movie. It's terrible. And I was bored out of my mind. I, my interest was like, I, I had no interest at all. I think when they popped out, I think when the zombies popped out of the ground, that was the only time I was like, hey, that's fun. It didn't belong and it was totally random. But I, there's no character development. There's no reasoning for anything. It's just things happening and boring things happening. I, I, can't, I can't recommend anyone waste their time on this movie. So a huge, massive pass on, on Resident Evil Apocalypse. Never again. The Mikayla. Mr. Passes. <laughs> the Lord, the Apocalypse of Passes. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that like these games and these movies and stuff are technically survival horror, but to me, they're not. To me, they are first person shooter games. And that's not my vibe of game. It's not my vibe of movies. These don't feel like horror movies to me. They feel like, honestly, like. In some ways, I think they are good adaptations of video games just because they straight up feel like watching a video game. Um, but it's it's just not for me. It's not my vibe. Never has been. I don't care if you like it. If you're a fan of it, that's fine. It's just not for me. Don't like it. You've seen the escort uh, a special kid from point A to point B done a million times and done a million ways better. Um, the editing of this movie is chaotic and strange in a way that you can't even follow the action sequences and... It's just every action sequence is just a bunch of people shooting all at once and then it's over. And that's not exciting to me. And that's not what I like to watch in a movie. So it's going to be a pass very for me. Lethar very lethargic fight scenes. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just like, I don't know, in a horror movie, like when everything just gets resolved by like a big shootout, I'm just like, well, who get that's not, I don't care. That's not a horror movie. It's an action movie. Uh, it's, just, it's just not for me. I like uh, the first movie years ago and then never followed through on the rest of them. And I, Unless Colin twists our arm and makes us watch the next four, I'm not going to watch any of them. So, uh, hard pass. Sean? Um, I, I'm a big fan of the Resident Evil games. Um, I've been playing them since uh, my parents got me a PlayStation and hooked me up with the uh, director's cut of the first Resident Evil game. And I've been playing them ever since. Um, I really like uh, I like what they do. Uh, I like their stories and everything. Um, and that's that's where Resident Evil should stay. Um, I watched this tonight, and I remembered why I stopped watching these movies after this one. Um, I will give this movie one uh, uh, credit for one thing. Uh, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but uh, this movie definitely feels like cutscenes from a Resident Evil game. Like, I, I get that feeling. They look like it. Um, uh, they look like it. They feel like it. The problem is, uh, I've never just wanted to sit down and watch an hour and a half of cutscenes from a Resident Evil game. So that's a major problem. Um, wow. Uh, this, uh, I don't know, movies like this exhaust me. Um, I can't believe, Colin, I can't believe you got through four more of these movies. Um, <laughs> uh, it just, it, it, it's exhausting. 
um, that nothing makes sense. I, I'm just, I'm bored. Like, I don't get to sh- I play and shoot the zombies. Like, I, these characters suck. I, I was neutral on this movie because I hadn't seen it in years. Um, didn't remember much about it. Uh, uh, watching it tonight and then having to talk about it, I now hate this movie. Um, and I, I never want to watch one of these movies again. I don't know how I feel about the first one. Um, I haven't seen that one in many years. I remember liking that one when it first came out. Um, but who knows now? Um, I, I will never watch this movie again. Curse you, Colin. Curse you. Um, <laughs> do you ever bring another one of these movies to the podcast? I swear to God. I really didn't expect you to hate it this much, Sean. I really didn't. I'm surprised I, I, by how Again, I was neutral on it, but having to talk about it <laughs> it, 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 made it angered you just decided. Yeah. Not only did I have to sit through an hour and a half of it, uh, but I'm just I'm angry that I had to like go more and then talk about it. I would have been finally like, Well, movie's over, I can go back to regular life now. No, now I had to talk about it for an hour and a half. So that's what made me angry. Um I, I was fine before we started the podcast, now I'm just pissed off. Um, if you, if you, if you're a fan of Resident Evil, just stick with the games. The games are great. That's a lot of fun. Um, what they're doing now with the remakes and all that stuff is, is pretty good. Uh, I don't understand these movies and, uh, I'm going to go kill myself. Uh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> pass on this movie. Uh, uh to you, Colin. Whoa, whoa. Colin, no, Colin, before, Colin, before you start, I have to, I have to ask, did you know what you were doing to us? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, wow. Yeah. I don't want to better or worse. Yeah. He had well, to have known. I, oh yeah, I knew. He chose, he chose the second, sick he chose, fuck. He chose the first sequel of a six movie franchise of a modern, uh, <laughs> mostly modern uh, series. Like what, what? This is not Colin. This is. I know. This is, yeah, was, I was throwing you. This a, was pointed. Yeah. This was uh, purposeful. This was. Uh, malicious, <laughs> strategic. This is what all those oh. '90s movies feel like to me. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So I was, I guess, I was originally going to bring Silent Hill. I've had Silent Hill on my list for months. Where I'm like, I'm going to bring Silent Hill. We'll talk about that. You but then, it, dude. I know, because then I'm like, parents for a year. No, I, well, I can't do it now because basically this is the conversation that I was. I figured this is how it was. I've been going. with for Silent Hill than for these movies. I know, but I was going to end up talking a lot about Resident Evil because Resident yeah. Evil basically started Silent Hill, and then there'd be this whole thing, and it was like, okay, well, let's just yep. look at a Resident Evil movie <laughs> <laughs> and go back. So, um, I mean, there's nothing. I don't really disagree with anything that you said. <laughs> Um, I still watch them all anyways. Yeah. And see, this is the thing that I, you know, you, you're like, well, I can't explain it. Well, I can. Okay. So, um, the things that are wrong with the movie are glaring. Yeah. The, 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 the people who make them right, which is the guiding hand. I'm laying it all at Paul W S Anderson. Um, doesn't, he's not like an actual filmmaker, right? I mean, he's aping movies where people have made, uh, um, uh, you know, significant contributions to the genre. He's just borrowing from it and cobbling all together, putting the name resident evil on it, because I believe that he is a big fan of the, uh, the video games. That's why I'm saying the video game is a significant seismic event because, uh, at least in its industry did, uh, you know, echoes of it are reverberating in game design and in, you know, survival horror is a thing. And, you know, uh, as it keeps on reinventing itself, you know, now VR was the last one. And it's like, I think the yeah. only and the best VR game that that's out there right now. Um, but the, uh, the director doesn't know how to shoot action. Um, I have a problem with, um, the action heroes of the late nineties and two thousands. This is a, the epitome of my problem with these characters. You are giving us superheroes who have no discernible weakness. So yeah. whenever, um, you know, they're just too fucking strong and confident in every situation that they go into. So you never engage with them on a human level. There's nothing you can't, you know, it's like, yeah, they're going to wander into a thing and shoot stuff. And only by virtue of whatever the plot says that, oh, they couldn't catch the exploding bullet that time. But, you yeah. know. Because even when you're watching, it's like, that makes no sense. If this is super person, how come somebody was able to sneak up behind them? Well, it's because they have to be friends with the person who just shot them over the shoulder and killed the one behind them, you know, 
but it's like they should have been able to take care of that because they're super person. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think a lot, you see that a lot now in modern movies where like the, you know, the fast and the furious movie, they all do this where it's like, these people are not, they're not, uh, I keep going back to, uh, uh, John McClane as like my, uh, even Rambo to a certain, but John McClane was like a humanized hero that you related to because you're like, this guy is outmatched in every situation that he gets in. It's only through luck and ingenuity that he's able to get through it. That's how I like my action movies. Um, that being said, at the time I saw this movie, I had a reaction similar to yours. And since then I have played a lot more of the resident evil video games on the ones that came after it. And now when I watch them, there is that kind of like, Oh, it's Jill Valentine. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> Oh, it's the nemesis. So I do get that. It's like, it's just this fanboy uh, level of like, Oh, I see what they're doing there. Barry's in it. And he, Oh, he's got his gun. You know, I was like, eh, it's Leon. He's got the hairdo, but you know, but these are not characters, but I understand. And I guess I, it, it's affecting me in some way that, you know, being steeped in the video games and playing them for hours on end and going back and doing speed runs and all this stuff. And then, you know, when you see them, uh, you, to a video, to a fan, a hardcore fan of the, the series, then the movies do play a little different because they are clearly speaking directly to you at the expense of everything else, <laughs> plot, logic, uh, emotion, character, <laughs> anything. They're just like, here's some of those characters made flesh and blood and look how we pulled it off and look at this little nod to that. So I can recommend this movie <laughs> Oof. to those people, especially in, uh, in light of, because it, you know, if you were also like me, you saw it and you didn't like it the first time around. I think this is the closest that the, um, the, the movie series gets to, uh, the feeling like the video game. So, I mean, basically yeah. that's my recommendation is if you're playing the new ones, uh, the remake of resident evil two, the remake of resident evil three. Uh, if you go back to this movie, I think you'll have a, a greater appreciation for it now because you know, the first time around when they made those games, they couldn't look as good as the movie. And now the, the, the games do. And so now the movie feels more somehow uh, relevant to it, but I know that's kind of like a twist your arm around the, you know, uh, crazy contorted way of recommending a movie because you no, know, the whole series is, um, yeah, that's a weird reach around recommendation right there. <laughs> they I are, would, they I are would bad. like our, uh, I would like our listeners who are also fanboys and girls such as yourself. I would like them to write in and let us know if they agree with that. I'm telling you, you got it for the, the most entertainment you're going to have in the next 10, 15 minutes, go over to letterbox and just read <laughs> any resident evil review. I swear to God, it just blew my mind. <laughs> blew my mind. I'm like, there can't be this many four star reviews of any of these resident evil movies. <laughs> and every once in a while you get the half star and I'm like, okay, that's a person who stumbled into this going like this movie sucks. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just saw it. I'm, this is my honest reaction and everybody else is putting it through the film school uh, lens. I don't know. Or they're making fun of film school. Who knows? You got to read it. It's uh it's interesting stuff, but okay. So there you go. It's a uh, resident evil apocalypse next week. We're going to watch go. a movie that's chosen by Sean. What are we watching next week? Hey, uh, what do you guys know about Texarkana? A lot. That's where the, yeah. uh, isn't that where the Falk monster comes from? Sure. Oh, that's Texarkana not what you're talking about. Killer. That's oh, what you, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> that's probably closer. The only things I know about Texarkana is there's beer there. And serial killers. And so next week, we're going to focus on the serial killers. And we're going to watch the original Town That Dreaded Sundown. Sean, I was going to pick this next. <laughs> <laughs> Finger on the pulse. We're getting into, we're getting into the, the hot, steamy summers. I think we need a hot, steamy summer yeah. serial killer movie. Yeah, hell yeah. For sure. I like it. All right, awesome. I was going to say the other one is The Legend of Boggy Creek, right? Yeah. Let's see how they text Arcana monster. Okay. So town that dreaded sundown, the original next week on the Saturday night freak show. We hope you'll join us. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.